Sublime, the tragic death of Bradley Noel and history of the band. Sublime, the iconic Long Beach, California band, left an indelible mark on the music world with their unique fusion of ska, punk, reggae, and rock. But did you know that Bradley Nowell's untimely death holds a jaw-dropping secret that has remained hidden for years? What mysteries lie within the history of Sublime? In this video, we will discover the heartbreaking truth behind his tragic demise and delve into the captivating history of one of the most iconic bands in music history. So before we get into this, hit that red subscribe button and make sure you stick around till the end to avoid missing any part of the story. Childhood friends Eric Wilson and Bud Gaw shared more than just their Long Beach neighborhood. Eric's father, Billy Wilson, played a pivotal role by teaching Gaw the art of reading music and drumming. Together with Michael Happold, who would later become Sublime's manager, they formed a punk trio named the Juice Bros during their high school days. In the early 80s, Bradley Nowell and bassist Eric Wilson played in punk rock bands, though their early jam sessions were far from successful. Nowell was keen on reggae, while Wilson had reservations. Their musical partnership was put on hold when Nowell went off to college. It wasn't until 1988 upon Nowell's return to Long Beach that they reunited. Bud Gauff, a neighbor of Wilson, joined as the drummer. This reunion set the stage for the birth of Sublime. The band began to make a name for themselves, playing at backyard parties and dive bars in Southern California. Despite the challenging venues and sometimes dangerous crowds, they performed in front of hundreds of fans, earning upwards of $250 a night. Wilson recalls those early days. We played some pretty rough neighborhoods. You'd have to be afraid for your safety. Gangster kids would show up at the parties and there would be trouble. Somebody got stabbed one time. The gigs were so intense that even Samoan guards were occasionally hired for security, and police helicopters hovered over the shows if they exceeded the noise curfew. In 1990, a significant development occurred in the life of Bradley Nowell. He rescued a Dalmatian named Louis, affectionately called Lou Dog after his grandfather. Lou Dog quickly became the band's de facto mascot, and at times, Noel's alter ego. This loyal companion would accompany the band on the road and occasionally join them on stage, endearing him to fans. The band's journey took an exciting turn when Michael Miguel Happold, a music student, offered to manage them. He enticed the band with an offer of free studio time at his school. Happold effectively became the de facto fourth member of the band, a crucial figure in their early career. With Happold on board, the band had the opportunity to record their first demo. Sneaking into Happold's school studio late at night, they recorded Ja Won't Pay the Bills, released in 1991. This demo marked their early foray into the music scene, showcasing their unique punk, reggae, and ska blend. However, the band's journey was far from straightforward. Using a $1,000 loan from Noel's father in 1991, the band financed and recorded their debut, 40 Oz to Freedom, on their label, Skunk Records. They sold the album out of the back of their van, an entrepreneurial endeavor that managed to move around 30,000 copies. They were already headlining clubs by this point, demonstrating their growing popularity. Despite the band's promising future, the two years between their first album and their sophomore effort were marked by financial difficulties. Intense living and hedonistic behavior left them with little to no money. Unable to afford studio time, the band had to play additional live shows to raise the necessary funds for recording their sophomore effort, Robin the Hood, which was eventually released in 1994. The album's recording process was far from ordinary. It was crafted in an earthquake-damaged house with pirated electricity, a testament to the band's resourcefulness and commitment to their music. Robin the Hood showcased a more diverse sound than their first effort combining folksy acoustic music with rock rap and spoken word segments. Notably, the album featured a duet with Gwen Stefani, highlighting Sublime's growing influence. From 1993 onwards, Bradley Knowles' battle with drug addiction took a turn for the worse. His inner turmoil was laid bare in the band's music, most notably in the song Pool Shark from their second album. Knowles' struggle soon spilled over into their live shows, where it became increasingly challenging to ignore his deteriorating condition. According to Spin Magazine, Noel often positioned himself on the edge of the stage during tours, 
struggling to make it through a song, let alone a set. His addiction reached a point where he would occasionally pawn off the band's equipment while on tour, only for their manager to retrieve it just in time for the next show repeatedly. By early 1995, Sublime had built a solid local following but had not gained significant national attention. However, their fortunes would soon change, largely due to the influence of local L.A. radio station Croc. The station added Sublime's three-year-old song Date R to its playlist, turning it into one of the most requested songs by listeners nationwide. Despite their newfound success, Sublime lacked the distribution network to push their albums to a wider audience. They initially received an offer from Gasoline Alley, a label affiliated with the major label MCA. However, the label's executives made the band wait for hours during a meeting at their office, leaving them frustrated and disappointed. Recording sessions in Austin proved to be as tumultuous as the band's lifestyle. Leary eagerly accepted the opportunity to work with Sublime, acknowledging the band's uniqueness. He recounted the challenges, stating, One day they came to me looking all concerned, and I thought there was a problem. They said, We start recording at noon and we're already drunk. We need to start earlier in the day. So I arrive early the next morning and they show up with pitchers of margaritas in hand, already drunk. It didn't matter when you started, they would be drunk. The chaos didn't end with the alcohol-fueled recording sessions. Lou Dog, the band's beloved mascot, wreaked havoc in the studio, scratching up the floors and needing to be sent back home in a crate. The band nearly burnt down Willie Nelson's studio when they placed a towel over a light bulb in the studio sauna, accidentally setting the room on fire. The band's antics extended to their living arrangements. The condos they stayed in during the album's recording were repeatedly trashed, leading to their relocation multiple times. Furthermore, Noel's struggle with addiction continued, with him frequently disappearing into the bathroom for prolonged periods during recording sessions. Concerned about Noel's behavior, Leary complained to the label, leading to Noel's immediate return home and the suspension of recording sessions. Bradley Nowell's girlfriend, Troy, temporarily left him during this period as he worked to get clean, which he successfully did for several months. Finally, the band managed to complete the album. Brad and Troy married on May 18, 1996 in Las Vegas. Those close to Noel were hopeful that he was on the path to a healthier life. On May 25, 1996, tragedy struck the music world as Bradley Nowell, Sublime's frontman, succumbed to a fatal heroin overdose. This devastating event unfolded in a San Francisco motel following the band's final live show in Petaluma, California on May 24, 1996. Noel's lifeless body was discovered at 11.30 a.m. in his motel room, marking the end of his journey at just 28 years old. In a bittersweet twist of fate, some sublime fans remained unaware of Noel's passing when the band's self-titled album was on the brink of colossal success. The album, released two months after Noel's death, propelled Sublime to worldwide fame. Notably, their single, What I Got, became the number one spot on the modern rock chart. The album's remarkable reception led to its certification as 5DUX Platinum by the Recording Industry Association of America, RIAA, in December 1999. Alongside What I Got, the album featured other beloved posthumous singles like Santeria, Doin Time, Wrong Way, and April 29, 1992, Miami, all of which received extensive radio play. Following Noel's tragic death, Sublime's surviving members moved on to other musical projects, with some joining Long Beach dub all-stars. Lou Dog, the band's faithful mascot, was cared for by the band's manager until he passed away on September 17, 2001. His family ensured he would rest alongside Noel, scattering his ashes in the same spot as the former Sublime frontman. In 2009, the surviving members of Sublime reunited under the band's name, with Rome Ramirez as the new frontman. This decision led to a legal battle with Troy and Noel's estate. Eventually, they changed their name to Sublime with Rome. Troy has since remarried, and Jacob, now in his early 20s, has followed in his father's footsteps as a frontman, leading his own Long Beach band, Law. Struggles, addiction, and tragedy marked Sublime's journey, but their music is strong evidence of their unique blend of genres. 
They left an indelible mark on the ska punk and reggae scenes, and their influence continues to resonate with fans and musicians alike. Bradley Nowell's battle with addiction cast a shadow over Sublime's journey, highlighting the challenges and pressures faced by artists in the music industry. The band's story serves as a poignant reminder of the importance of support, understanding, and intervention for those grappling with addiction. With that said, let's give it a wrap. But before signing off, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. See you again with another exciting video.